like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. And welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar. Thanks for joining us. We have Luigi Fontana on tonight, who's one of the world's experts on nutrition and healthy longevity. Uh, many of you like topics around nutrition, so I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. So use the Q&A function to ask those questions. Also, uh, this is we're into our 60s now in shows. And so we have a lot of different shows you can go back and look at on YouTube. Um, but if there are topics that we haven't yet covered or that we, you'd like us to cover again that are particularly interesting to you, feel free to suggest those uh, after the show uh, in the comments section because we're trying to uh, find areas that uh, are of particular interest to the audience. Uh, today we have, before we start with Luigi, we have Matthias Robert, uh, who's a research assistant in uh, Karen Krasta's lab here at the uh, Healthy La Longevity Translational Research Program. He'll be talking about a recent uh, story on exercise uh, regulating NAMPT levels and ultimately NAD activity in cells. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Matthias, and today I will be sharing with you this uh, short research paper that particularly looks into exercise and how it alters our metabolic activity uh, through exercise and vesicles. So uh, some background on this paper first. So this paper focuses on, on, on a key enzyme called NAMPT, which is an essential enzyme in the biosynthesis of NAD+. So NAD+, is also a very important metabolite involved in many key cellular processes, such as DNA repair. So these both things are very important because they have been found to be decreased in older humans. And also with aging rodents model that was treated with EVs containing NAMPT, it seems to have a very profound effect in terms of its uh, health span and lifespan, but also positively affect physical activity as well. So the, the key question here that uh, the authors want to tackle is that essentially, are there any links between levels of NAMPT containing EV, NAD level, and also physical exercise in humans? So to tackle this question, the authors then uh, recruit part participants that are separated into four groups. You, you could see here that there are four groups, young and fit, young fit, mature unfit, and mature fit groups. So these are all uh, separation based on age and also the status of uh, aerobic fitness based on VO2 max uh, cutoff. So um, blood plasma would be collected uh, in this part from these participants before and after workout. And extracellular fascicles will then be isolated from the blood plasma and NAMPT levels would be checked in these extracellular fascicles. In addition to, to that, uh, these extracellular fascicles could also be incubated onto, the, onto a recipient cells in a cell culture model where the authors could also measure 
intracellular NAD levels and also intracellular uh, CERT1 level, uh, sorry, intracellular activity of the CERT1 enzyme, which is a key en enzyme that is dependent on NAD levels. And also it has been shown that CERT1 have also a profound effect in terms of uh, lifespan and health span in mouse models from previous studies. So what are some of the key findings on these papers? Well, um, in terms of the EV NAMPT levels, you could see that uh, post-workout, especially in the young fitness, uh, in the young fit group, there is a significant increase in uh, EV NAMPT levels. Across other groups, uh, you could see that there is an interesting trend as well except for the mature and fit group, which are not increasing. Another key findings that I want to highlight is that these pre and post exercise EVs, when they are incubated into a recipient cell, uh, they can actually induce uh, increased levels of NAD. You could see much more significantly in the younger uh, groups compared to the mature groups. And this, is, this trend is also consistent with the CERT1 activity, where you, you could see much more significant increase in the younger groups compared to the mature groups. In another experiment, the authors use a compound called cyclohexamide that can block protein production. And they treat the cells with this compound in conjunction with the EVs isolated particularly from the young fit group. So despite the presence of this compound, we could see that there is uh, still an increase in NAD levels, suggesting that these EVs acts directly to alter our, our, the metabolism of the cells without inducing any protein expression. So to summarize on this study, uh, it has been shown that mature individuals with lower fitness did not show any increased uh, EV NAMPT in response to exercise. But despite that, mature individuals who are fit actually displayed comparable amount of EV NAMPT release after exercise uh, to that of the young and fit group. So I think the main takeaway on this study is that um, Aerobic fitness induced by physical exercise could overcome some of the age-related problems and decline, particularly on NAMPT release. That's all from me. Thank you all for listening. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, so I'm going to move on to Luigi. He's the professor, uh, L.P. Ullman Chair of Translational and Metabolic Health and Director of the Healthy Longevity Program at the Charles Perkins Center at the University of Sydney in Australia. Um, he's also a physician scientist, and he's been his career has really been devoted to understanding how dietary restriction works in humans and the benefits that come with it uh, and how that might work to prevent age-related chronic diseases. Today's talk is about changing the conversation from chronic disease to chronic health. Thanks for joining the show, Luigi. Hi, Brian. Thank you for inviting me to, to, to give a talk uh, in, um, in, uh, in this important. So let me start with a, with, a, with a short introduction because I think, you know, we both agree that, you know, our, you know, they call them sick healthcare system, but in reality, they are sick care medical system and uh, trillions of dollars are spent every year to treat and manage diseases that are basically mostly preventable. So just to give some numbers, in US, the healthcare uh, costs went from 2.8 trillions in 2013 to 4.1 trillion in 2021. And 90% of these uh, 4.1 trillions, these are CDC data, are spent to treat disease, chronic disease, after they have occurred. The results are that US life expectancy decreased by 2.26 years 
basically from 19, uh, 2019 to 2021. So in US, basically, life, the average life expectancy is decreasing. Now, on top of this problem, there is the uh, pandemic, I will say, of aging populations. Everywhere there is a, a, a huge increase in the number of aging individuals. For example, in, uh, in Japan, they are already 23%, like in Italy, predicted 36% of people older than 65 in 2050. In Singapore, you went from one in 14 in 2000 to predicted one in four in 2030. So basically in eight years, one in four Singaporeans are gonna be older than 65. On top of that, you know, there is the unhealthy aging because aging by itself, if you are healthy for most of your life is a good thing. But you know, the problem is that, you know, these are data from a study within Italy, but there are similar data in US. Basically, if you take people older than 65, 90% they have at least one chronic disease and 65% of people older than 65, they have two or more chronic diseases that are mostly due to a combination of an healthy lifestyle. So this is an important, an important message. So as you can see here, the most common chronic disease we see in our hospitals, they share a common metabolic substrate. You know, that, you know we, are, we are dissecting me and other, many other people. You know, we are trying to understand what is this common metabolic molecular substrate that causes an accumulation of metabolic molecular damage with aging. And what we are uh, discovering is that a number of lifestyle factors in green they are all contributing to this abnormal metabolic substrate that is causing uh, some of the most com common type of cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, stroke, vascular dementia, and probably Alzheimer's disease, fatty liver disease, chronic nephropathy. So I will say 80, 85% of the most common chronic diseases. And another important point is that, you know, aging doesn't start when you are 65. Aging starts in utero, well, before, from a, for epigenetic reasons, what you do when you are a teenager basically uh, is influencing epigenetically the risk of your kids and grandkids and grand grandkids to develop all, developing multiple chronic diseases. So with our lifestyle and potentially in the near future with some CR mimetics in combination with a healthy lifestyle, you can decelerate the rate of accumulation of metabolic molecular damage, or with your unhealthy lifestyle, you can accelerate the accumulation of metabolic molecular damage, leading to multiple chronic disease and accelerated age. Now, as Brian said, you know, my expertise has been, you know, mostly the effects of uh, diet in, 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 uh, in, uh, in promoting health and in slowing aging. And uh, I decided to study these because there were data in, in 1940 about the effects of calorie restriction without malnutrition in rats. And then over many, many years, it has been shown that, you know, diet restriction without malnutrition is extending lifespan in multiple organisms. In mice, you know, for example, and in rats, you know, there is an extension up to 50% with multiple metabolic and molecular adaptations. It's striking that basically uh, uh, dietary restriction, for example, is acting on all the hypothalamus uh, pituitary axis hormones. So it's one simple intervention is acting on so many important hormones that are controlling the key function of our organism. And uh, I don't have time to go into the details of the mice data, but in monkeys, we know that, you know, color restriction in monkeys, this is the Wisconsin study, is extending lifespan and health span significantly, is totally preventing type 2 diabetes, 50% reduction in cancer, 50% reduction in cardiovascular disease, less neurodegeneration in several important areas, less atrophy measured with fMRI in, in area that are controlling motor function and executive function. There is less sarcopenia, interestingly, uh, than uh, the, 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 the uh, as you can see here, the slope of decline of uh, 
uh, muzzle mass, it's uh, much lower in the CR animals than in the control animals. And that because basically based on uh, uh, rosy uh, studies uh, and other studies, you know, the uh, color restriction is um, uh, inhibiting the accumulation of inflammation, fibrosis, uh, uh, and is changing the metabolic uh, substrate of how the muscle working. And so the, the muscle are, uh, they stay younger because, you know, the molecular damage is less with CR. And so the idea of more protein, less sarcopenia, I think it's oversimplistic is the quality of the muscle and the stem cells repair that is important. And, you know, you need intervention that is slowing down the accumulation of damage, not giving more protein to build more muscle. And not only there is less sarcopenia, again, in the, in the, in the Wisconsin CR monkey study, there is also less frailty. So as you can see here, a number of frailty parameters that are significantly better in the CR animals and the number of frail animals in the CR old animals is only 30% compared to 78% in the ad libitum fed monkeys. And the NA study, even if it's uh, underpowered to look at longevity, has shown an improvement in health span. But most strikingly, a third of the CR animals, they live more than 40 years. 40 years for a monkey is like basically 120 years for humans. And Sherman, a monkey nicknamed Sherman, lived 44 years. That is the equivalent of 135 years for humans, suggesting that in animal, in, in, in non-human, in, in primates, it's possible to markedly extend life. And of course, we have a lot of open question to understand how different factors are interacting. But for example, this DNA methylation um, study in the CR monkeys shows that at least in, with this biomarker that is the methylation drift, the, the, the monkeys, they look seven years younger in terms of uh, biological age. Now, what about humans? Because really, you know, we are interested not in extending lifespan of mice and flies and worms, but of humans, I think. And uh, we know based on study we did, you know, these are calorie phase one study with uh, John Holodzy at WashU that both CR and exercise uh, can uh, reduce body weight approximately 8%. Uh, I want to point out that, you know, many people think, you know, the exercise doesn't induce weight loss. In reality, as you can see in this randomized clinical trial, we were able to achieve an 8% weight loss over a year. What, how? by exercising, these people that were exercising one hour a day, six days a week at se between 78 80% of max heart rate. You know, with this amount of exercise, even without color restriction, you lose 8% weight loss and 40%, 39% of visceral fat. Both CR and, and, and exercise were reducing around 40% visceral fat. You know, we had major improvement in multiple cardiometabolic risk factors from cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, C-reactive protein. But most interestingly, we had a major improvement in glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. So more insulin sensitivity means less hyperinsulinemia, less compensatory hyperinsulinemia. And we know that insulin is very important for aging because in all the study we have done, you know, with multiple animal models of longevity, whenever you downregulate the insulin adjuvantor pathway, the animals are, are living healthier and longer. Okay, so improving insulin sensitivity and uh, reducing IGF-1 by availability by increasing IGF BP1 and BP2 is, an, a, is a key factor in promoting health, is one of the key factors. Now, in calorie phase two, we also look at younger individuals, 20 to 50 years old, BMI between 22 and 28, randomized to 25% calorie restriction for two years or control. In reality, we achieved on average a 13% calorie restriction, so a very modest calorie restriction. However, with this modest calorie restriction, the BMI went from 25 to 22.5, we achieved a super physiological improvement in all cardiometabolic risk factors. So this, this is the metabolic profile at the end of the study. 
as you can see here, total cholesterol 158, LDL cholesterol 89, HDL cholesterol 53, the ratio 3.1, triglyceride 78, fasting plasma glucose 81, systolic blood pressure 110, diastolic 68. This is a super physiological cardiometabolic profile. If people in US or in Singapore, in Australia, they had this type of cardiometabolic profile, the risk of developing a myocardial infarction will be less than 5%. Instead of in, in our Western countries, cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease is the first cause of death and, uh, and morbidity. Not only that, you know, with this 13% calorie restriction, we had a significant reduction in uh, urinary F2 azoprostens. This is a gold standard to measure oxidative stress in humans. We had a significant reduction in inflammation measured as a C-reactive protein, TNF alpha, less white blood cells, less neutrophil lymphocytes. This is very important because there is this emerging field of uh, clonal hematopoiesis. So it looks like that if you have an excessive hyperinsulinemia, excessive stimulation due to growth factors, your stealth cells are proliferating more. And, and now we can measure that in humans with, uh, with, uh, with PET. And, and, and the more uh, activation, proliferation of the stem cells, hematopoietic, but not wholly hematopoietic, the more risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer. Now, some studies in animals are suggesting that, you know, color restriction has an immunosuppressive effect. And here in this study, in this human study, in this randomized clinical trial, we demonstrated, you know, that, you know, there was a reduction in inflammation without immune impairment. We vaccinated people with uh, hepatitis A, tetanus, diphtheria, and pneumonia, and there was no uh, significant impairment in the antibody response. And uh, my friend um, Deep Dixit published a paper recently in Science showing that in the same cohort of individuals, calorie restriction was increasing thymus volume, and not only thymus, it was also increasing uh, the number of um, uh, thymocytes. So basically, there was a kind of rejuvenation, a li like a, a contra uh, effect on the typical involution of the thymus and the reduction in, in circulating uh, lymphocytes. So very, very interesting. And it, and it was made by a molecule, PLA2GT, that has been uh, uh, that is produced by adipose tissue. So the adipose tissue is producing this molecule that basically is increasing thymus volume. And then, you know, we have published many other papers showing that color restriction in humans is uh, uh, improving left ventricular diastolic function. So the ventricle of these people is younger, more elastic. So in some ways uh, is, is, uh, re is slowing down the, the fibrotic uh, uh, process of uh, <clears throat> uh, diastolic dysfunction. There is a, a higher heart rate variability. Again, you know, there is a, a, an effect in, in, in slowing down the typical unbalance between the sympathetic parasympathetic system that is influencing so many organs and function in our body. And uh, again, you know, with our papers, we have shown that humans adapt to uh, color restriction without malnutrition as uh, uh, animals, as mice on color restriction do. So there is a number of uh, metabolic hormonal adaptations that are similar in humans and in rodents that are living longer on color restriction, with one exception. There is no reduction in IGF-1 in humans uh, with color restriction, unlike in rodents, but there is a major increase in IGF BP1 and BP2. Now, in these people, we are also able to do uh, biopsies of skeletal muscle and colon uh, mucosa. And we found that at the molecular level, we see similar adaptations, you know, with the downregulation of the IKT, PI3KT PI, PI pathway, increase in FOXO. And we see an increase in proteins and genes for autophagy, for DNA repair, for uh, antioxidant activities like SO2 and catalase. We see a, a significant increase in gene and proteins for ICSI protein 70, so chaperones that increase proteostasis. And we see a major reduction in multiple 
pro-inflammatory cytokines and transcriptional factor li like NFKB and STAT5. And finally, with Marco De Maria, we have shown that basically in the colon mucosa, uh, CR is reducing markers of cell senescence like P16 and P21. Now, uh, this is our, these are unpublished data. Uh, we, we, we in, in the column causa of uh, these uh, people on color restriction and age sex matched uh, people on exercise, we perform a number of uh, um, biomarkers of biological aging, like the Levine Pheno age. Uh, and then, you know, on the, we, we, we did the DNA methylation, of the, this is the Horvath DNA methylation clock. And this is the EML, the 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 the, the, the drift in, in in mutation load, and we see basically that both CR and exercise they are basically between three and four years younger, depending on the type of biomarker. But it looks like that basically different type of uh, biomarkers are uh, basically uh, featuring. They are yeah, they are capturing different type of. Uh, biological of age uh, uh, markers. Indeed, you know, in this study, we also have metabolomic, proteomics, gene expression by RNA sequencing. And uh, in, these, um, in these analysis, you know, we did, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, multi-omic analysis, we are finding again that, you know, different uh, 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 biomarkers of aging, they are capturing a different uh, picture of the biological age. Now, very quickly, I just want to tell that uh, dietary restriction is not only working in primary prevention, but you know it has a powerful effect also in secondary prevention. I'll just give you a few examples very quickly. I don't have much time, but you know, in this study we perform in people with diabetes, a 25% calorie restriction for six months, reducing a modest five kilos weight loss resulted in multiple improvement in multiple cardiometabolic factor, blood glucose, cholesterol, systolic, diastolic blood pressure, insulin sensitivity, angiotensin 2. I want to remi remind you that, you know, the angiotensin 2 uh, knockout mice live longer. And then, you know, we have shown that, you know, there is less, uh, there is a reduction in albuminuria and a reduction in uh, glomerular filtration rate. These are two of the most important biomarkers for, uh, the, um, for uh, the progression into terminal nephropathy. So basically, you know, with a quick six months color restriction, you can improve multiple uh, biomarkers of uh, damage to the kidney due to, to diabetes. Uh, in this study, in uh, people with type 2 diabetes who lost more than 50 kilos, they had 86% of them, they were in remission of type 2 diabetes. And this other study of people with fatty liver disease, those that lost more than 10% 10, 10 of their body weight had a, a almost total resolution of NASH, and they also had a regression of fibrosis. Amazing. So not only there was less fat in the liver, but there was also a, a, a regression of fibrosis measured with liver biopsy. Now, very quickly, I want just to tell you that when I started to work on calorie restriction, the dogma was that only calories were important, the composition was not important, or the distribution of the meals. Now we know that they are important. Uh, we know that, for example, in, 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 in animals that are doing intermittent fasting, there is an extension of health span and lifespan. However, I want to point out that mice are not humans. So two days of fasting in mice, they die, People, even people like me, you know, they can go for a month without eating. So, you know, comparing intermittent fasting in mice and in, and in humans is not a good comparison because probably one, you know, the intermittent fasting of mice is similar to three days of fasting in humans, three days of feeding, three days of fasting, three days of feeding. So I think, you know, that's important. Indeed, you know, we did a randomized clinical trial and we showed basically that uh, uh, intermittent fasting uh, uh, that resulted in a, in a basically 8% uh, weight loss. So we achieved 8% weight loss in six months with this intermittent fasting protocol and a 16% reduction in body weight didn't result in 
in, in a reduction in inflammation. So C-reactive protein, all the cytokines and chemokines were not changed by this uh, significant weight loss. And there was a minor, minor change in glucose or insulin levels, suggesting that a calorie is not a calorie, okay? So the composition of the diet deeply influences the uh, response to weight loss. And in this study, because you know we did color mucosa biopsies and we did RNA sequencing, metabolomics, proteomics, gut microbiome, we are finding that there is a hot spot. You know, if you are losing uh, two uh, up to two point five units of BMI, you have an increase in in uh, in uh, in autophagy genes and a reduction in mTOR uh, genes. Instead of if you are losing more than two point five units of BMI, so if you have an excessive uh, weight loss you have the opposite. You have an inhibition of autophagy and you have an increase in mTOR activity. So I think, you know, we need to study better what, 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 that, what, what this means and uh, because the data are really provocative and very interesting. Another important point is the composition of diet. You know, Steve Simpson and others and Linda Partridge and many others have shown that protein intake and certain amino acids are very important for, for longevity. We knew that methionine restriction has a powerful effect in increasing lifespan in rodents. And, uh, in the, and, and there are multiple pathways you know, through which amino acids are regulating aging pathways. And, uh, and we are finding that in rodents with Dudley Lamming that you know, uh, brain chain amino acid restriction by itself is without ca calorie protein restriction can improve glucose tolerance and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, in humans in, in a randomized clinical diet that in humans we found that protein restriction so pe these people they were eating 64 grams of protein instead of 95 basically these result in a significant reduction in circulating brain chain amino acids there was a significant reduction in weight loss, 2.6 kilo in four weeks. This was isocaloric reduction in body fat, cholesterol, and we had a significant reduction in glucose like in animals with a major increase in FGF21 and a major reduction in C-reactive protein. Now, finally, I just want to point out that uh, the composition of the diet is also changing the gut microbiome, especially protein and fiber that are very important in regulating the type of bacteria. And in this paper we publish in Cell Host Microbiome, we are finding that the metabolomic response to calorie restriction depends on the type of bacteria that we have transplanted in germ-free mice. So as you can see, it's a very complex picture. It's not just calorie in and calorie out. There are many factors that are interacting in shaping metabolic and molecular health. And you know we have to understand better how it works. So conclusion, very quickly. So when I had to work on calorie restriction 20, 25 years ago, it was basically just you know, animal data. There was nothing in humans. And you know, it was at the beginning when I was presenting people, they were, oh, mm, calorie restriction. Now I think you know, that the idea that nutrition and dietary restriction plays a major role in promoting health and longevity is well accepted. And you know, we publish important review articles in Science, Cell, and lately in Nature Review Molecular Cell Biology describing all these processes. Of course, you know, diet is only one factor in the longevity puzzle. So there is, there is the interaction between our genes and different dietary uh, components, but physical exercise, I don't have time to go into the details, is also very important. And uh, other factors, you know, are are important as well, and especially the mind. So let me just briefly tell you something because I think you know this is something that I really I'm getting interested into that, uh, and is this one that you know right now the longevity research is just concentrated on on body health. So basically, we are dissecting how you know, different interventions that are impacting physical, physiologic, metabolic, cellular, and molecular health. However, I want to remind everybody, you know, that, you know, we also have a mind. And as human beings, unlike mice and rats and worms and flies, you know, we have an emotional health. We have a creative, artistic health. We have a spiritual health, intuitive spiritual health. We have, you know, other 
characteristics that are typical of healthy humans, like altruism, compassion, and uh, uh, you, you, you that in, in, in Greek means basically wisdom, means happiness. And, uh, and so I think, you know, that, you know, it's important that, you know, we are starting to understand that, you know, even if you are super healthy and you're living longer and we are going to discover, you know, basically uh, tricks on how to extend lifespan and health span, we have to understand, you know, living a, a, a long life uh, in a, 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 as a selfish uh, and and sad and aggressive, uh, uh, lonely human beings. I don't think you know is 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 good for 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 humanity and for the planetary health. And so, apart from you know trying to understand how diet and and exercise and potentially CR mimetics, there is a lot of research that is very interesting. And I think you know the combination of these three of these three interventions together, they're going to give us a lot of exciting results in, in promoting uh, health span and lifespan, but there is also a more functional on the mind of the brain. And so cognitive training, sleep, there is a lot of problem with sleep nowadays. Uh, there are breathing techniques that are very important to regulate the sympathetic, parasympathetic system. There is mindfulness. And then again, there is the spiritual health social and emotional learning are very important. Art and philosophical education, altruism, compassion, spiritual exercises, all together are, I think, are necessary to promote human health, global human health, and also to protect nature and our planet with a new mindset that is focusing more on our growth as as human beings than on just living longer for the sake of living longer. If you want to, to, to read a bit more about this concept, you know, I wrote a book, you know, describing my philosophy, my idea about this concept that is not just longevity. And I also have a YouTube channel where I post videos on the, on, on many of these topics. And uh, that this is my last slide. I just want to say that, you know, I think, you know, with the biology of aging, Brian Kennedy and many other colleagues and friends, you know, we are starting to change the paradigm that uh, it, from, the, from chronic disease to chronic health. Because if we want to have a, a healthy and sustainable uh, uh, medical system and also to protect the environment, we have to move from this type of uh, approach to this type of approach. That's the only way, you know, we can make our health system uh, sustainable and our uh, environmental and humanity grow in a, in, in, in a healthy way. And uh, I would like to thank, you know, my collaborators at Washington University, in many universities in the U.S., and now my new colleagues at uh, University of Sydney. This is the Charles Perkins Center where I'm working now. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Luigi. That was great. Um... I think maybe uh, let me let's start with uh, calories and and work up to you know spirituality. How about that? I think that uh, from a calorie perspective, maybe you know a lot of your studies are ten to twenty five percent calorie restriction in the humans. Uh, and can you just provide a perspective on what that means for an average person in terms of intake? No, to be honest, you know, the, the last study, like, you know, calorie phase two, you know, again, you know, we achieved only, a, a th you know, we, we had spectacular results, you know, with a 13% calorie restriction, you know, of course, you know, these were younger individuals, again, 20 to 50 years old, and they were not obese individuals, as I said, you know, their mean BMI was 25 at the beginning of the study. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after two years, they achieved at 22.5. So they lost 2.5 units of, of BMI. So they didn't become like the cronies, you know, super skinny, you know, 22.5. And yet we had a spectacular improvement in many of the cardiometabolic factors similar to the cronies. So I, I don't think, you know, we need a excessive calorie restriction. It depends where you are starting. You know, what is, you know, as you know, and as you are doing in your lab, I think, you know, we need to become more sophisticated in finding biomarkers 
of biological aging, of health. So, you know, we can understand what is the baseline health and the baseline um, biology of aging of uh, our, ho- our organs and, 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 and tissues. And based on that, you know, we, we can prescribe uh, 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 interventions that are targeted. Otherwise, you know, it's like with the monkeys. Why, you know, with a similar color restriction, you have monkeys that live more than 120 years, more than 40 years, and some monkeys that didn't. So we don't have a full picture of the complexity. I guess what I was getting at, though, was people say that calorie restriction is really hard to do. And, you know, what what does 10 to 15 percent calorie restriction mean for an average individual in terms of how much they eat a day? But it's not true. You know, I think, you know, it's not really it's not really the quantities, you know, in a study. I, I didn't have time to present some data, but, you know, we. Before I, 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 I came here to Sydney, I did a randomized clinical trial in the US where I fed people for two months a Mediterranean diet, basically whole grains and beans and fish and uh, nuts and seeds and lots of vegetables, poultry only, only once a week, no refined processed food, uh, no red meat. I had to overfeed these people 250 calories of healthy calories to refrain them for, for losing weight. Otherwise, mm-hmm. I, they, they were losing weight like crazy. So just by improving the quality, you're going to lose weight. Okay. Then, you know, if you are also using some tricks like, you know, stop eating before you are full or, you know, do some intermittent fasting, uh, vegetable fasting, plus exercise, you know, the amount of calorie restriction you need to, to get is not massive. Like, you know, people that think, you know, an empty plate. No, yeah. no, yeah. absolutely not. Well, that, that gets to the question of food composition. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners are confused by this because we have a lot of people that read about aging and healthy aging. And, and we've had a lot of people on our show talking about fasting and keto diets and dietary restriction and, you know, so maybe you could give us your opinion about the composition of that. You already mentioned, I think, what you think is a healthy diet. How does that compare to something that a person would call, I mean, a keto diet in the sense that high fat, high protein, low carb? Look, you know, like, you know, you know where we are coming from, you know, before, you know, a lot of people that were prescribing diet based on weight loss or based mm-hmm. on improving diabetes or based on improving, you know, I don't know, whatever. Sort of our perspective was, you know, what are the interventions that are extending lifespan, maximal lifespan? And so if an intervention is extending maximal lifespan, it's acting on the aging, the, the aging pathways. So if we look in animals, the interventions that are extending lifespan are color restriction, intermittent fasting, protein restriction, methane restriction, and uh, tryptophan restriction. I don't know any, anything else, you know, it's a, that's, that's the reality. All the other interventions that, you know, Weindruch, Mazzaro, and many other people, they, they tried over many years, they didn't work. Yes, they improve health, but they didn't increase lifespan, and therefore they didn't uh, work on the biology of aging. So uh, there is no doubt in my mind that, you know, the caloric, and uh, protein, especially certain amino acids, there are we, we are still trying to understand what are these amino acids, but probably the sulfur amino acids like methionine, the branch and amino acids, they are very important in regulating mTOR, okay? And other, other important uh, pathways, there are sensors for, for aging. Now, the ketogenic diet in reality if you are on a strict ketogenic diet, you are on calorie restriction. So that's the reality. It would be nice to do a study where you clamp the uh, caloric intake. So you overfeed people a ketogenic diet, and I would like to see the results. Mm. Because if you are on a ketogenic diet and you are on calorie restriction, of course, you know, you have an improvement, some improvement. So again, uh, based on the data we have in animals and in some data in humans, Calorie restriction and intermittent fa- and and um, and uh, protein restriction, certain amino acids, they are very powerful for fasting. As I said in my slide, intermittent fasting works well in mice, but one day of of, of fasting in a mouse 
is not one day of fasting in a human being. So unless people, they are ready to do three, four days of fasting cyclically. So basically you do three, four days of fasting, three, four days of feeding. I don't think it's going to work because just to give an example, one day of fasting in mice is reducing IGF-1 big way. One, one day of fasting in humans does not. You need three, four days of fasting to reduce IGF-1 in humans. One day is not enough. I think you've so, tried some long fasts. Uh, what did you find when you did that? When, when people, they are fasting three, four, five days, you have a 50% reduction in IGF-1. So it's approximately like a 10, 15% reduction each day. You know, so it, mm. it accumulates. Again, fasting is a good strategy to help you to help you to achieve calorie restriction. But by itself, the idea that, you know, one day a week or two days a week, you eat 500 calories and five or four days a week, you eat whatever you want. I don't think it's going to work. The data that, you know, we have and other people have are not positive. Let me ask one or two more questions and then we'll go to the audience. I think we're breaking the record for questions tonight. Um, So here's another one I get all the time. Yeah, calorie restriction is good and exercise is good. What if you do both together? Do you have to eat more calories or different kinds of calories if you're exercising? Look, you know, we don't have data in humans about that. You know, John Hollow did a study many, many years ago where he compared uh, uh, exercise with calorie restriction. And he found that basically exercise, so being lean because of exercise extend average lifespan, so therefore health span, but not maximal lifespan. Instead of calorie restriction was extending both average and maximal lifespan. Mm -hmm. When he combined exercise with calorie restriction, there was a similar increase in uh, life. There was not an additive. So the animals that were exercising and doing calorie restriction, they were as as, uh, healthy and they live longer as the CR animals. Of course, you know, we need more experiments. So right now, I think, what I think, you know, personally is that exercise is essential. You know, you know, just doing pure calorie restriction without exercise, I don't think it's going to be healthy o- o- over a long term, okay? And it's very, very difficult. I think, you know, a, 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 a certain amount of exercise or different type of exercise is necessary. On the other side, if people, they think, you know, they just exercise and then they eat whatever they want, that's not healthy. Let me ask one more question. I want to get to the end topic about spirituality and the mind. And, you know, you yeah. have, this book is uh, quite exciting. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how do you recommend a person achieves this sort of um, holistic health strategy? I mean, is, do you ha- is, there, is there sort of a recipe in there? Or, I mean, I mean, can this be achieved at the individual level or is it a societal problem? I mean, how do we go about getting there? Well, I think, you know, it's a societal problem. As you know, in many Western countries, in U.S., there is an epidemic of, uh, of opioids use. You know, there is a drug addiction, alcohol addiction. There is a, there is a huge increase in, uh, in, in the consumption of antidepressants and a lot of psycho, uh, a lot of drugs, you know, for, for stress. And, uh, and the same here in Australia, you know, the rate of suicide or problems in, in, even in, in, in teenagers is huge. And uh, mental health is a major problem in this country and not only in this country. So definitely there is a major problem with how probably we approach education, self-education and societal education. And there is very little space for programs that... Uh, educate people since they are uh, teenagers or even children on uh, developing their own uh, emotional, artistic, creative, spiritual health. And is it, is it, is it, so if I can summarize, think about it, you know, everything you learn is because, you know, you are growing synapses. Okay. For example, when I, when I came from U.S., and I start to hear in, in, in Australia, I had to learn to drive on the left. For all my life, both in Europe and in the US, I was driving on the, on the right. Believe me, for the first month, it was a problem. To drive on the left is not easy. 
because you are used, you know, you know, to 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 have you know a certain way of looking at. The, the, I, I figured since you're Italian, you just drive in the middle. So <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Still, you know, when there are small streets, you know, you have to drive on the left. So after a month or two, I gr I grew my new synapses, and now basically I'm able to drive on the right, on the left, without any problem. So if you think about it, you know, everything we do. So if you spend part of your day, you know, in uh, in uh, in activities that are, uh, you know, uh, you know, altruistic activity, artistic activity, compassion, happiness, you are growing those type of synapses. Instead of if you are, you know, spending most of your day, you know, thinking about negative thoughts and, uh, you know, you are aggressive, you are sad, you know, you develop those synapses. So there are a number of activities that, you know, people, they should engage that day after day is forcing their brain to grow those synapses. And therefore, like I'm able now to drive on the left, then, you know, some of these activities, they become normal. And I think it's absolutely necessary because, as I said, you know, let's say, you know, we're going to discover the cocktail of longevity where, you know, we're going to have, you know, a number of CR mimetics and maybe combined with uh, a modest calorie restriction exercise that is going to extend lifespan like, you know, Sherman to 135 years. I think it's feasible, you know, because if we were able, we were able to do it with monkeys on calorie restriction, you know, to get, you know, monkeys living more than 40 years. I think, you know, that, you know, if we combine uh, CR mimetics with, 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 with a number of uh, personalized healthy lifestyle, you know, that's doable. But if, you know, you are a, a lonely, sad, angry, nasty person, what's the point of living? Mm. Don't you think? Yeah. I agree. I think on that note, I want to go to the audience and maybe I'm going to bring uh, Jan in, who's one of our graduate students, who's working on um, an intervention, a glycine, to see what it's doing to aging, speaking of amino acids. But uh, tonight she's going to be answering, addressing questions. And I want to just start with the first one from the audience, okay, because there, we already, we have someone uh, pushing back a little bit on keto and calorie restriction, saying that uh, they've done a 5,000 calorie a day keto diet and didn't didn't gain weight. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. And, and then after that, Jan, can you just jump in and start asking questions? I haven't seen this data, you know, that, you know, that, you know, people, they, they, they feed 5,000 calories on a ketogenic and... Uh, this is an individual doing it, yeah. So it's a single person. I, well, I mean, I don't. There may be others, but this, we're talking about one person right now. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I know people that they, they told me you know they went to Lourdes and they 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 were treated from cancer. So I mean, you know, I don't believe you know single <laughs> anecdotal stuff. So you're saying we need studies? <laughs> yeah, we need studies exactly. Yeah. What I know, you know, for sure, you know, that, you know that uh, these are studies in 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 Colorado they were doing basically a kind of ketogenic diet, time receded feeding, and people basically, uh, because they had to eat all their food, you know, within an eight hours window, just before uh, the eight hours mark, they went to the fast food and they ate as much as they could, you know, before the eight hours, their cholesterol, total cholesterol, <coughs> LDL cholesterol basically skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Jan, you want to ask some questions? Yeah. Yep, so thanks very much, uh, Prof. Kennedy, for the introduction, and thank you, uh, Professor Fontana, for the very interesting and very insightful uh, presentation. We have lots of, questions from, lots of questions from the audience, so first, maybe I'll start with Diogo. So what is your opinion regarding the fact that uh, large-scale trials of caloric restriction using dozens of mice strains show that the effect goes from beneficial to nefarious and anything in between in a strain-dependent manner? Well, I think, you know, you know, Rafa de Cabo published a beautiful paper in Cell Metabolism showing that if you take uh, those strains that uh, on 40% uh, calorie restriction, they didn't live longer. When he put them on 20% calorie restriction, they live longer, suggesting that, you know, uh, you can overdo calorie restriction. You know, we know that, you know, if you are restricting too much, if animals, they go on starvation, they live shorter, okay? 
So the question, you know, probably different strains of mice, they need a different degree of color restriction. And so maybe for the DB, I forgot what, it, what DBA mice, 40% color restriction is like 80% color restriction on a, on a black six. And so for this animal, 20% is more similar to 40%. So I think, you know, but Rafa told me that, you know, even those animals that, you know, on 40% color restriction, they did not live longer. Exceptionally, when he do the auto, he, when he did the autopsy, they were super super healthy. So in terms of health span, there was a super effect, but they lived shorter because probably they were starving. So we have another question from David. Uh, so it, he says uh, it appears that the beneficial effects of calorie restriction or fasting diminish, diminishes with age. Uh, is there a possible reason for this? Look, in animals, we know that, yes, it's age-dependent. So if you do 40% color restriction in, uh, in, uh, in a very young uh, mouse, basically you have a 50 to 50, 40 to 50% color restriction. The same 40% color restriction in a middle-aged, uh, in a 12 months old mice is only increasing lifespan 15, 20%. This is a science paper by Walford and Weindruck. Uh, and it makes sense in some way because, you know, as we said, you know, the accumulation of metabolic molecular damage doesn't start when you are 65. It starts in utero. So if by 12 years of age, you know, you already have accumulated a lot of, lot of damage, yes, you can undo some of this damage, but you cannot undo all the, of the damage. Um, Luigi, we're going to steal just a few extra minutes, like five, if that's okay, because we have so many questions. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. So the next question, um, how long does the beneficial effects of calorie restriction or fasting last for once you stop? I don't know. I mean, there are some studies, you know, even in uh, with, 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 with drugs, with rapamycin recently showing that there is a memory uh, in humans. I don't know. I don't know. Because again, unfortunately, in 2022, we don't have biomarkers of biological age. So our, our, the, our, our only way to right now to, to say if an intervention is slowing down aging basically is if it does increase lifespan, okay? And therefore, you know, to, 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 to have an intervention and say, you know, that there is a memory, even in mice is very difficult. You know, in humans is impossible. Once, you know, we have developed, you know, solid biomarkers of biological age, then, you know, we're going to be able to answer those questions. Right now, I think it's just wishful thinking. Has anyone in the calorie study done a sort of chase where people go back to a regular diet and see how long the metabolic benefits persist? I know that uh, they are trying to raise money to follow up the people in calorie uh, phase two and see, you know, how they are doing. But I, I'm not, I, I don't know, you know, I remember, you know, you know, we were talking about before I left, you know, US, we had a meeting, we have a group meeting of the scientists who were working calorie and we were, you know, uh, thinking of, uh, you know, writing a grant, you know, to do exactly what you said, but I don't know what, if they did it or not. So we have another question from Camille. So uh, thank you for showing the classic Pelosi paper. It implies that uh, while exercise is healthy, it is a far cry from a real anti-aging intervention like rapamycin or caloric restriction. Uh, would you agree? So can you, can you, can you rephrase the, the question? If I agree that exercise is not as powerful as rapamycin? Yep. Or, and cal caloric, or restriction. calorie restriction, yeah. Well, as I said, based on the animal that we have, the data we have in animals, exercise extend lifespan, average lifespan, therefore health span, but not maximal lifespan. So probably, yes, there is something more than the insulin sensitivity and other factors, you know, typically exercise, 
is uh, triggering that is responsible for the anti-aging effects of color restriction and rapamycin. Yeah, because probably, you know, exercise, if you think, you know, exercise, you know, is a high energy flux. So you are eating a lot of calories and you are burning these calories. But, you know, the amount of calories or proteins that are going through the nutrient sensing pathways is, is the same or even more than the ad libitum fed uh, sedentary animals or humans. Instead of calorie restriction, in some way is down-regulating, is a, is a low energy flux status because you are down-regulating the nutrient sensing pathways because less energy and amino acids, they are stimulating the nutrient sensing pathways. Thank you, Prof Fontana, for the response once again. Uh, so we have another question from Ziva. So in terms of calorie restriction benefits, how do you comment the fact that for elderly, uh, a higher BMI of 25 to 30 was found to be optimal? For example, several studies show that BMI below 25 in elderly men and women was associated with increased mortality Overweight individuals with BMI of 25 to 29.9 had the lowest mortality. Well, this is a good question. Of course, you know, this is based on epidemiological data, and there are several reasons for, for this data. One is that, you know, those who are surviving uh, probably uh, are those who have uh, basically higher body fat because basically a lot of people who are becoming frail and they lose weight as they age is because they are sick. You know, we did a study published in BMJ a few years ago where, as you know, the, you're, there is this U-shaped relationship between BMI and mortality. So it looks like, you know, people with a BMI less than 25, they have the same mortality than uh, people who are obese. And, uh, and these data have been published in JAMA, but there are other papers even in, in Asia showing this U-shaped relationship. So with Frank Hu from Harvard, you know, we uh, reanalyzed the uh, physician uh, and the nurse health studies. And not only we stratify people by BMI, but also we stratify people by healthy lifestyle factors. And so basically what we found is that in people who are sedentary, eating an healthy diet, smoking over drinking, yes, there is a U-shaped relationship. So people who have a BMI less than 22.5, they have the same mortality than people with a BMI higher than 30. But in those that were exercising five, hour, five days a week, they were eating healthier diets, they were not smoking, the uh, 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 mortality was... 60% lower in those with a BMI less than 22.5. The question was of the study, how many people in US in, in this cohort of people had a BMI uh, uh, lower than 22.5 and they were having healthy lifestyle? It was basically less than 10%. So the great majority of people in US, they have a BMI less than 22.5 is, is as it is with an healthy lifestyle. And this unhealthy lifestyle basically is causing all this molecular damage. You know, there is less autophagy, more, less DNA repair, more oxidative stress, uh, less uh, uh, proteostasis, uh, less uh, there is, you know, all these factors that are inhibiting stem cells. They are accumulating and they are causing weight loss. But the weight loss is not due to exercise and calorie restriction, it's due to aging, to acidity aging. And that's why I think, you know, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, people who are the people basically that are lean because of this unhealthy lifestyle and accumulate damage, they die well before those who are uh, uh, overweight uh, uh, and when they are older. I think so, yeah. Uh, and I think I better jump in because we're running out of time. Thanks, Jen. And uh, thanks, Luigi. It was great. Um, We'll have to have you back because we didn't get to anywhere near all of the questions. So um, lots of people are interested in this. There's a lot of different kinds of information out there and we'll continue to try to provide clarifying thoughts on diets and healthy lifespan. But thanks a lot, Luigi. Oh, thank you for having me.
Okay. I want to remind everyone to use the panelists and all attendees function option in the chat function to leave comments and feedback on the show. Um, look for news for our center and the School of Medicine and the end credits. Uh, go to our Twitter account and add more comments on what your healthy diets are. Uh, next episode, we'll have one of our own, Professor Rong Lee from the Mechanobiology Institute at National University of Singapore. And she's going to be diving inside cells and looking at mitochondria and other organelles and how they impact aging processes. Uh, that'll be October 6th. So remember, next week is a um, uh, off week. And then I will come back October 6th with the next show. Andrea Meyer will be there. And on our final uh, our video, I want to leave you with a 97-year-old grandmother talking about powerlifting. Turns out that since I have been powerlifting, which is about five years now, my breathing has improved. Uh, my COPD is not gone, but it certainly is not only under control, but um, it's uh, so manageable that I, I hardly even think about it anymore. And on the mornings that I really don't want to go to the gym, I just have to remember that if I want to breathe, I want to participate. These ladies, some of them have been doing it for five years, and they lift weights, first of all, that they didn't think they could lift. But if other people would take their lead, their example, and just try it, they would hopefully discover the joy that it's brought to me for all these years and to them. When I have lifted, especially when I have been increasing my amount of weight and I'm, I'm sure, but I'm not sure that it's gonna work. It is an awesome feeling to know that you have accomplished something that's not easy to do. There's no reason in the world for you to do it, but the fact that you have accomplished this task for your own benefit and your own ego, um, it's an awesome feeling. I recommend it to everybody. <laughs>